Today we're talking about horses during the Regency period and in particular what kinds of horses you might find in town, what kinds you might find in the country, and what they might be used for in those different places. Because during the Regency era, if you wanted to get around or you wanted to accomplish something, chances were good you were going to need a horse. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Henderson and I write Regency romances. If this is of interest to you, then welcome and let's get started. First, you might be asking yourself, what differentiates a pony from a horse? And the answer to that is the height. A pony is always 14 hands or under, and a hand is four inches. I have no idea how people came up with the idea to measure horses by hands, but it works. So a hand is, as I said, four inches, and my hand at its widest points is four inches. So if I were to use this part of my hand right here, that would measure four inches. So if I started at the bottom, at the ground of a horse with its feet right there, and I put my hand here, and then I put this one on top, and I did that all the way up to the horse's withers, that would give me the measurement of how many hands tall that horse is, or how many hands high. Now, a pony is, as I said, always 14 hands or under. And a horse, then, is anything above 14 hands. So a lady might ride a smaller horse, maybe 15 hands, maybe 16, and a man would always ride a horse that was larger simply because he was probably heavier and a larger horse would be able to accommodate him. So let's talk about ponies to begin with. There were several different types of ponies that one might find. Some are the Shetland ponies, which are from an area of Scotland. Very sure-footed, and they're able to get around on rocks and things like that. Now, a pony that is called a cob, C-O-B, that would be a pony that's not of a specific breed, but would be short and stocky and sure-footed and something that would be good for perhaps doing some light work on a farm. Also known for being really unflappable. So that would be something also that might be used to teach a child to ride or for perhaps a woman to use to pull a cart if she needed to get into town or was going to go and visit some neighbors. Now the other small animal that might be found on a farm and particularly might be used by someone who really wasn't very wealthy was a donkey. Donkeys were used for farm work and the advantage of donkeys was, first of all, that they were very inexpensive. I've read in some places that for about five shillings, someone could acquire a donkey. They didn't necessarily need to be fed just oats and hay, which made it much more affordable for a family to have a donkey. Now let's get into horses, to those who are above 14 hands high. One of the types of horses that would be found in the country and would also be found in the city but around wharves and in areas where heavy things needed to be pulled are what are called draft horses. Those breeds would be Clydesdales, Shire horses, or Cleveland Bays. Frequently, they were at least 17 hands high making them really big and really strong. The disadvantage of a draft horse is that they are slow. So a draft horse is not something that is going to be used typically to pull a carriage where someone wants to get to their destination quickly. Also, a draft horse eats a lot. So Keeping a draft horse well-fed is going to take quite a bit of money. 
in town during this era, it typically cost about 30 pounds a year for someone to feed their servant. And it actually cost less to feed a human servant than it did to feed a horse. For that reason, many people who needed horses would rent them because that would be much more cost effective than to actually own the horse. There was a luxury tax on owning a horse, which was 30 shillings per year. And then stabling would cost about 120 pounds per year for a horse. And then there were also other things like food and blacksmiths and other expenses that one would have with a horse. So a draft horse was for work. But as we all know, people also had horses that were used for entertainment and for luxury reasons. These were race horses, carriage horses, and hunting horses, all of whom have their own special characteristics. Let's start with the carriage horse, which is something that most people would need if they had any intention of doing some visiting or needed to get around. A good carriage horse would cost around 100 pounds and much more for something that was considered a fancy carriage horse. But the more popular kinds of horses that were used for carriages were what are called high stepping. So they have more knee action in the front, which makes it really pleasurable to watch them and exciting. Those would be horses called trotters. Cleveland bays were also used for carriage horses. And there was also the hackney horse. These are all types of horses that might be used to pull carriages. A racing horse was designed for racing either on the flat, which means the kind of racing that we see in the United States, like the Kentucky Derby, that's on the flat, or they might be horses that were trained in fences, in jumping, and that would be a steeplechase. Those are two very different kinds of horses. Both might be thoroughbreds, but there's a great deal of difference. When the Regency era began, racing over the flat might be as much as four miles, and there might be multiple heats in a day where one horse was expected to be able to run for a really great distance. That changed as the Regency era wore on, and ultimately the distances were shortened as well as the fact that there was only one race and those heats or multiple sessions where the horse was expected previously to run weren't required. As a result, race horses went from being big stocky older horses to much more sleek younger horses that were only capable of running for shorter distances. So this is a major change that's happening during the Regency era. The Jockey Club in England was formed in 1750. And in 1791, what was called the General Stud Book was instituted. And that tracked which horses were considered to be thoroughbreds and how they are all related, what their bloodlines are, which is a very important development and something that is really in the British racing world considered to be sacred. Only those horses who are descended directly from the horses in the general stud book are considered to be thoroughbreds. And with regard to thoroughbreds, there are only three sires that are considered to be the foundation of thoroughbreds. Those are the Byerly Turk, the Godolphin Arabian, and the Darley Arabian. Those three form the foundation of British thoroughbreds. A hunting horse is a little bit different from a racing horse. A hunting horse would be a little bit more sturdy 
and would be a cross between perhaps a thoroughbred and a draft horse, making it larger, more heavily boned, and capable of not only running across distances, but also jumping fences. Many people during this era paid for a subscription for hunting. And what that meant was that there was kind of an organization that would enable them to hunt maybe as many as six days a week. For the ultra rich who had their own hunting arrangements, they were done by invitation. So only if you knew someone and were friends with them would you be able to hunt in that way. Whereas with a subscription, you could pay and be assured that you would be able to go hunting even if you weren't friends with the ultra rich. My name is Elizabeth Henderson and I write Regency romances. Let me know what you think or what questions you have in the comments. Thanks so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.